About is the opportunity for us to have a close conversation led by our professor. I have a conversation about 1963. And he just morning kicked us off with a wonderful talk on MLK, what 1963 meant in his life. What we'll do now is we'll broaden out a little bit and talk about what 1963 meant both in the past and what it means today for this country. I want to thank once again all the folks who co-sponsored this event. Um, we've been so thankful to have their help. Uh, again, the Stanford Institute on Race, the Department of History, the American Studies Program, African and African American Studies, the Department and the Department of Religious Studies, and of course the Humanities Institute here at Stanford, Humanities Center, excuse me. I also want to give a shout out to uh, our dear brother, David Lai, who's here, who's uh, uh, one of the folks that works with us at the King Institute, whose work that you have indirectly read or consumed or heard about because of all the work that David's done over the years at the King Institute. I want to thank David for being here with us this afternoon. So let me go through really briefly and introduce our um, speakers. For today, they'll offer some short remarks and then we'll turn to a conversation. Um, you all are welcome to present to where you are sitting, or you're welcome to come up here to stand at the podium. So we're gonna go in the list that the panelists are listed. So that's the order we'll go in. So let me start and introduce Dr. Jean Theo Harris, who's a political science professor at Brooklyn College of City University of New York the author of an amazing book called The Rebellious Life of Miss Rosa Parks. Also, more recently, A More Beautiful and Terrible History, The Uses and Misuses of Civil Rights History. We're so thankful that she is here with us today. We have Haj, Dr. Haj Yaziha. Yaziha. Yaziha, thank you. I practiced and I failed, but that's okay. <laughs> Mr. Jonathan E. told us today that we don't have Wallace to be useful. <laughs> she is an assistant professor of sociology at USC, faculty affiliate of the Equity Research Institute, and the author of the most recently published book, The Struggle for the People's King, How Politics Transforms the Memory of the Civil Rights Movement. So we are excited to hear her comments as well. We have with us our colleague here from the um, law school at Stanford University. I'm so happy to have her here with us, Shireen Sinar. She's a scholar of civil procedure and litigation, civil rights, national security law, constitutional law here at Stanford University. Her work assesses legal responses to hate crimes and domestic and international terrorism under US law. She has written countless articles, some of which have been published in the Harvard Law Review, Stanford Law Review, Harvard Civil Rights and Civil Liberties Law Review, and other journals. And last, we have Dr. with us, Dr. Tom Jackson, who's here visiting with us, who's known Stranger to Stanford, he's associate professor in the Department of History at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. He received his master's and PhD right here at Stanford University. Contributed as a researcher and, bibli and bibliographer for the Martin Luther King Jr. Papers Project. So we're proud to come here. Dr. Jackson's book, From Civil Rights to Human Rights, Martin Luther King Jr. and the Struggle for Economic Justice, received the 2007 Liberty Foundation Award of the Organization of American Historians, the year's best book on any aspect of the civil rights struggle since the nation's founding. So we're thankful to have him here as well. So please, we'll start with Gene, whatever you feel comfortable with. You can start there, you can uh, go from here, and then we'll just go on the list that's listed um, there on the screen. And after the comments of all four of our panelists, we'll open it up for a moderated discussion and question and answer. Thanks. So good afternoon, it's so lovely to be here. Um, I'm passing out some post-it notes. Um, take one. So an unprecedented thing happens at the beginning of August of 1963. Martin Luther King of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference 
Roy Wilkins of the NAACP, James Foreman of SNCC, and James Farmer of CORE all joined together to come out to join a march in this city's because it's, it's having a kind of burgeoning local struggle around school segregation. The schools educating black students have, are so crowded that black students are only going to school four hours a day. Parents are dismayed because their children are being taught happy slave tales. And black teachers are being profoundly discriminated against in terms of getting jobs, and there's no kind of black people as school administrators. So this, there's probably no other moment where we see these four leaders come out to support a local movement. And so I would ask you right now to write down where that is. Why don't we know this? There's a familiar story of King in 1963. The Birmingham campaign, O'Connor, the fire hoses, the young people, Kennedy's decision to introduce the Civil Rights Act, the March on Washington, the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church. It's about the South about police dogs, fire hoses, a man by the name of Bull Connor, about courageous struggle, and finally long overdue federal action. But that's a narrow portrayal that misses as much as it reveals. Because in 1963, at the same time that all of those things are going on, Dr. King is also crisscrossing the nation to support movements across the country, in Detroit, in New York, in LA, in Chicago, in Boston. And one of the most popular phrases he's using in the early 60s and in 1963 goes as follows. This social revolution taking place can be summarized in three little words. They are the words all here, now. We want all of our rights. We want them here, wherever we are, north or south. And we want them now, in Detroit, in LA, in Iowa. He uses this kind of phrasing so many times that talk show host David Suskind asks him about it. And while he says, yes, Suskind asked him, would you really think you're going to see all here and now? King says yes in the South, but he doesn't talk about the North. All here now takes us out of the South to a king who, from the beginning of his leadership in 1957, was saying that segregation is a national cancer, not a regional sickness. All here now takes us beyond the lunch counter, beyond the Klan, beyond the fire hoses, to overcrowded schools, to underfunded neighborhoods, to rampant police abuse, to unions that black black workers, to mass marches of white mothers and mass organizations of white homeowner groups. What then would it mean to talk about Northern massive resistance in 1963? all here now. While King himself spurred Northern advocacy for change in the early 60s and in 1963, many of those same Northern supporters were refusing to hear or do anything about segregation and inequality in their own cities, even though he and many, many others were calling it out at the very same time in movements using very similar tactics, sit-ins, rallies, pickets, boycotts. And as he joined with those struggles in the early 60s, King was ignored, 
lambasted, picketed as a communist, and massively red baited for this work, just as other Northern civil rights activists were. King, in fact, would overturn the idea of the North as the promised land. Instead, he would say that waves of black migrants found a new Egypt where the pharaohs are more sophisticated. He retold the story, the history of the United States after the Civil War, where white people, including white immigrants, were given land and subsidies, the backing of the FHA and the GI Bill, and black people were largely excluded. This is Dr. King's history. Now a word on language today. I use North the ways that King and most black activists at the time did to encompass everything outside of the South. They did so in part to take on the prevalent conception that the race problem was a Southern problem and to take on the ways that Northerners pridefully cast themselves as not the South. And so he used the word the North and I do as well. So in my last few minutes, I'm gonna talk about three other quotes. So we got all here and now. The next one is as segregated as Birmingham. So one of the struggles that he's taking part in in 1963 is an escalating struggle in Chicago, right? Similar, um, so one of the issues that's happening in Chicago, in New York, in LA, is that schools are getting, that segregation is worsening in the decade after Brown, in part because um, we have more Northern migration and like, the Board of Ed in these places are redrawing the lines to keep schools segregated, which means that black schools are getting overcrowded, right? So they're going to things like double session days. And in Chicago, the superintendent decides what he's gonna do is he's gonna buy trailers. And so you see this burgeoning movement in Chicago in, like, um, in the early 60s that really kind of escalates in 63, where people are laying down in front of like construction of these trailers. They're picketing. It is a, it is a um, robust movement. King comes out in the spring. He's supporting them. And he calls Chicago as segregated as Birmingham. And the news media goes crazy. And Mayor Daly goes crazy. I think we want to remember, this is King calling Chicago as segregated as Birmingham while he's organizing the Birmingham campaign. This is not in 66. As segregated as Birmingham. And then as those pickets, those laying down in front of construction doesn't work, they escalate in the fall to organizing a school boycott in Chicago. And that will take place in October of 1963. 225,000 blacks, largely black students will stay out of school. So it's, it, it's equal to the numbers of the March on Washington. King had supported it beforehand. He comes back out to continue to support it, to support a boycott of Christmas shopping in, in Chicago, as segregated as Birmingham. And that school boycott and the school boycott in New York and the school boycott in Boston in February get roundly criticized. And so he takes, he has a regular column in the Amsterdam News and I'm just gonna read what he says. He, st he stresses, cause he's so pissed at how, how much backlash this is getting. The school boycott has proved very effective in uncovering the injustice and indignity that school children in the Negro Puerto Rican, right, he's, always clock he's already clocking Puerto Rican, Minority community face, school boycotts have punctured the thin veneer of the North's racial self-righteousness. Dr. King. All right, all here now, the segregated is Birmingham. This one, I think everyone in this room is gonna know, we can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of unspeakable horrors of police brutality, the March on Washington. But I think many of us, when we hear that, we think of Birmingham. And of course, he's talking about Birmingham, but he's also talking about LA. Dr. King is, again, in Chicago, in New York. He's there in LA. He's in LA more than 15 times between 1957 and the Watts uprising. And so he's coming and he's joining with various local movements in LA, including that he comes in 1962 and what has just happened in the city is um, uh, 
The secretary of the local mosque, Ron Stokes, has been killed. Another member of that mosque has been permanently paralyzed, and five others have been wounded by the police. And so an, a kind of united front movement with Malcolm X, with the NAACP, with the ACLU, with um, a number of local people on the ground, and with Dr. King is growing in the city around police brutality. So he's there talking about police brutality in 1962, about the need to replace Chief Parker. He's back in 1963, basically in the midst of him, um, in the midst of negotiating the Birmingham campaign, I mean, the, sorry, the Birmingham agreement. He's back. So again, when we hear, we can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is a victim of unspeakable horrors of police brutality. King is not just talking about Southern police brutality. He knows what's happening in the North. He's criticizing. And then what we will see in the coming years in 64 and 65 is him calling for a civilian complaint review board, him calling for police officers committing this abuse to be fired, him talking about this as a pattern, and him talking about the police and courts as enforcers of a kind of domestic colonial situation. Okay. Unspeakable horrors of police brutality. The last one, I won't forget us. We're staying in California. So this burgeoning movement around schools, right? Uh, people are organizing in LA around schools in the early 60s. Um, that movement escalates in 1963. King is, is here in May of 1963. Um, they, they move to having weekly marches all summer. And then in August, in LA, Roy Wilkins, James Farmer. So the answer was LA. Um, so if you ever go on Jeopardy and they ask that question, first call me and then say LA. Um, so this... So there's this incredibly robust movement in LA, but they're forced to turn their attention to this menacing proposition because, because also of work trying to push around housing segregation, they've gotten a fairly weak, but a first start um, fair housing law passed at the end of 1963. It's called the Rumford Fair Housing Act. It does not do anything about single family homes. It does not even cover apartment buildings with less than five, with, it's only if units with more than five, five units, sorry, I'm having trouble saying that. Still, it is a start. But just like massive resistance in the South, what we see massive resistance California style is any, any fair housing, any housing desegregation is seen as a threat. And so this incredible movement of white homeowners and realtors and mothers rises up in California, and Dr. King flies back and forth in February, in June, in August, in October, right before. And he's calling this, if it passes, one of the greatest tragedies of the 20th century. Let's think of everything he's even he's seen in the 20th century. He's saying, this is a vote for ghettos. And what happens in November of 1964, again, massive resistance, Northern style, is three out of four white Californians vote for Prop 14, which returns the right to Californians to discriminate in the sale and rental of their property, at the same time that a majority of Californians send Lyndon Johnson back to the White House. So the message is clear. Civil rights are okay as long as they don't come home. A vote for ghettos. So King will say, when Watts happens nine months later, right? a vote for ghettos. He is disgusted by the white shock and hand wringing. Where did this come from? Why are they so angry? He notes his disillusionment with the North. He would say later, if the mayor had listened to me, there would have been no Watts riot, right? So this, the narrative we have, right, where King discovers the Northern racism with Watts is patently. So this 1963 looks different. 
King looks different. He's not naive about Northern racism. He's not discovering it. He's not having some big revelation. We see, if we look at this 1963, we see segregation as pervasive and damaging in the North as in the South. And we also see movements as widespread, as creative in the North as in the South. Put another way, it's not that Black Northerners reject nonviolence, it's white Northerners, right? Because one of the reasons that none of us knew that question I asked you at the beginning is because nothing happens. Marshall goes to Birmingham, he does not go to LA. This 1963 is the where we live today. Movie segregation in the North is still the third rail of US politics. Despite the uprisings of 2020, funding for police and law enforcement continue apace. We could have fixed it then, we could have fixed it now, but first we have to face it. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Dr. Martin, for the invitation. Um, I've already learned so much as a sociologist in a space filled with historians. It's been so rich. And so I loved this question of why does 1963 matter today? When we look out at our present moment, when we look at the devastating wars abroad, and the ferocious domestic politics at home, a time when books are being banned, public libraries are being shut down, racial history is being outlawed. Some may ask, aren't these present crises more pressing than navel-gazing about the past? Isn't the fierce urgency of now about focusing on this moment and figuring out what to do about it? Well, I think to many of us in this room, it is apparent that there is no understanding right now. There is no paving a collective path forward without looking back. And I would go so far as to say that obstructing us from this clear view of the past has been the political project all along. And this is the project we need to understand in order to make sense of just how much 1963 matters today. 1963 matters today precisely because of a politics that tells us that it does not. Because of a politics that strategically revises and distorts the past to alienate us from the reality of just how much our lives today are shaped by the unfinished work of 1963 and the reactionary politics it set in motion. So I want to focus my comments today on these two distinct but interconnected questions, which is first, why we have been taught that 1963 doesn't matter, and second, why resurrecting 1963 is essential. Now, why do we live in a culture that treats the civil rights era as the last chapter in the book of racism? Why do we live in a culture where Dr. King's words are invoked out of context to do everything from rolling back voting rights to repealing affirmative action? to implementing these bans on racial education, where politicians claim that Dr. King himself would be ashamed of Black Lives Matter for their disruptive tactics, as if they're not using a page out of the civil rights playbook. This is the very question that I took up in my book, The Struggle for the People's King. And I studied 40 years of the political misuses of civil rights memory from 1980 to 2020, and sure enough, I identified this trajectory where powerful right-wing groups increasingly co-opted and distorted the memory of Dr. King and civil rights to claim that white conservatives were the new minorities under threat to justify rolling back multicultural democracy. And in these misuses of the past, 1963 is sanitized, filtered, Many aspects are cropped out, and all we're left with is one line about a dream. But what's most apparent beneath all these strategies is that those in power have long understood that the people's past, specifically the history of Black resistance, of Black imagination, of Black vision, is incredibly powerful. 
So limiting the American public's understanding of this past has been no accident. It was an intentional means of building what the black philosopher Charles W. Mills calls an epistemology of ignorance, of building this culture of willful unknowing. And as James Baldwin wrote so brilliantly, Ignorance allied with power is the most ferocious enemy justice can have. If we don't know just how much the past and its unfinished work explains our present state of affairs, if we believe the myth of racial progress, that our systems of racism were eradicated with Dr. King, then we don't have to do anything about injustice today. Worse yet, our denial actually makes us complicit in the system of power that is so committed to reproducing itself. But this brings me to the second question, which is the question of why 1963 matters today. So like today, 1963 was this moment of great instability and uncertainty. Like today, it was a moment where those in power understood the threat that was posed by masses of people coming together in solidarity when the state worked tirelessly to repress and surveil and manipulate the resistance, to create moral panics, to activate reactionaries to violent ends, as we saw in the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church that killed those four beautiful black girls. But 1963 was not only a year marked by violence, repression, and death. 1963 was also a year of great awakening and imagination of persistence and great resolve. It was a year that offers us the tools and the vision for the work that faces us today because the civil rights activists of that moment understood that our capacity to envision the future is reliant on our willingness to honestly face the past. Dr. King told us this in 1963 when he wrote his letter from a Birmingham jail where he connected the broken promises of the nation 340 year wait for rights and justice, the great stumbling block of the white moderate. He made sense of all of these obstacles through their historic roots. And he wrote, quote, history is the long and tragic story of the fact that privileged groups seldom give up their privileges voluntarily. Freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. That fall of 1963, King would begin writing Why We Can't Wait, his retrospective on the Birmingham campaign earlier that year. And in that book, he used history, the long durée of the Black freedom struggle, the interconnected struggles of oppressed peoples all across the globe over time to map this vision for revolution. And this was a vision that understood that progress would not be inevitable and that too many of us had been dosed by what King called the tranquilizing drug of gradualism, mm -hmm. the idea that we could just sit by and wait for change to come. But he knew that we could not wait, that too much was at stake, which is just how we should approach the present moment. Our understanding of 1963, of the past, in all its honest messiness and complexity is not just about helping us understand where we are today. It's also about building our capacity to envision futures beyond what we've been given. It's about reminding us of the power that we hold as we the people when we come together across race and class, across borders, through our linked fates, just as so many individuals did in 1963. It's about rooting immigrants like me in a shared history where oppressed peoples have united in this confrontational politics that disrupts quiet submission to the system, that puts sand in the gears, that troubles the status quo and demands attention. And this is the vision that we see today when the movement for Black Lives reclaims the radical king through a Black feminist lens that continues the unfinished work of fighting the triple evils of racism, capitalism, and imperialism. This is also the vision we see today in the resurgent Poor People's Campaign that calls for a moral revival to awaken our collective conscience. This is the vision we see amid the fascist politics that ban racial history by resisting through the self-described educational underground railroad. The brave educators, the historians, the activists who are fighting to teach Black history by any means. And as I see it, the symposium is itself a kind of radical convening in the spirit of 1963. 
It is itself an exercise in the politics of refusal, a politics that rejects the culture of ignorance that alienates us from our shared history, our inescapable network of neutrality. And in that legacy defining speech in 1963, Dr. King said, 1963 is not an end, but a beginning. So I think as we're reflecting on where we are 60 years on, it's worth remembering that our goal is not to know history as an end, but rather as a set of beginnings. Our goal is to recognize that the history of Black resistance is a blueprint for collective liberation. And this is why it holds so much power. This is why history is strategically withheld from us. And this is precisely why we should all be fighting for it. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Martin, for inviting me here. It's amazing to be part of this panel. I've learned so much from Martin and my co-panelists, both here and in the uh, So I'm especially glad to see that this convening is framed in part as being around 1963. Uh, and particularly the moment of the 60th anniversary of Attorney General Bobby Kennedy's memo granting the FBI permission to wiretap Dr. King. And I think that moment is important to remember for a couple of reasons. Uh, for one thing, and this is uh, consistent with the themes of the earlier two presentations, uh, it highlights actually how much of a pariah Dr. King and the civil rights movement was seen during much of the 1960s uh, despite the national myth that we now have that uh, retroactively uh, thinks of him as having been celebrated, at least in the North, during that time. Uh, and that's something I've learned from Jean Theo Harris's work. Um, but the moment of surveillance being initiated by Bobby Kennedy, I think is also important because it shows us that the repression against King and the civil rights movement was not about one man, J. Edgar Hoover, it was about the highest state officials uh, approving of that surveillance. And so sometimes the story gets to be told of one that is very personal in nature. And you know, we, we know, including from Dr. Martin's work, that J. Edgar Hoover uh, and his own support for white <coughs> Christian nationalism did shape the FBI for many decades. But at the same time, the surveillance went far beyond, and the author authorization for surveillance went far beyond Hoover. Uh, it went up to the highest levels of the federal government, and was also the practice in state and local police agencies. Um, so I want to bring our focus actually to the present to talk about the FBI as it has operated in the last 20 years in the context of the global war on terror uh, that focused on home in the US. Uh, and here, too, uh, I. Uh, the focus, I think, should be on structures, institutions, and ideas that perpetrate and legitimize state surveillance and repression, rather than individuals, whether it's Trump or anyone else that we might think of as being associated with them. Um, so taking us back to the days and weeks after the 9-11 attacks, the public, all of us, were terrified. Security agencies had been caught off guard and quickly took to responding not just aggressively, but showing the American public that they were doing something. Um, Vice President Cheney famously told a reporter that the US would have to venture to the dark side to fight the threat. Uh, and the FBI at home embraced what it called a preventative approach to counterterrorism bent not on prosecuting people after the fact, but preventing violence in the first place. And that idea of prevention has intuitive appeal and resonance to prevent violence rather than respond retroactively. But the way it was conceived and implemented by the FBI was problematic from the start and has had dramatic effects on our communities. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about how that prevention regime unfolded over the past 20 years. First, the FBI and broader security agencies defined the threat in racial and religious terms that treated US Muslim communities as inherently dangerous and subjected entire communities to surveillance and investigation. So you may recall in the weeks after 9-11, the FBI, uh, then INS, 
rounded up about 1,000 immigrants, mostly Muslim men, who were flagged for suspicion because people called in racialized tips about their neighbors or people in the street or others that they had met. In time, the FBI actually took to mapping the locations, institutions, activities of Muslim communities all around the country so that they could be better identified and surveilled. They built a network of hundreds of undercover informants tasked with reporting on these communities. They placed hundreds of thousands of people on terrorist watch lists where you could get on the list based on a bare factual showing and have almost impossible time getting off. And the FBI and its the other related state agencies conducted mass surveillance communications with tools that were far more sophisticated and sweeping even than those used in the 1960s. Uh, the second point beyond this kind of racialized definition of the threat and the, the focus on entire communities uh, is that the methods used to prosecute, investigate and prosecute people uh, often targeted people who had not yet done anything, but in alignment with this preventative focus, um, they focused on people who uh, were identified as dangerous. And, and by the way, I'm speaking in the past tense, but this is actually not something that has passed. Uh, it's, uh, so <laughs> I might change my tense actually going forward, but uh, <laughs> this is you know, all policies that have continued to the present. Uh, so one of these problematic practices was the FBI's use of confidential informants and undercover agents in sting operations. Mm -hmm. And this has been pervasive in the domestic counterterrorism approach where the tactic is to approach people who may have made comments, for instance, on social media that appear sympathetic to violence. And then the FBI agents actually create opportunities to act upon those sympathies. And those who take the bait, even after substantial pressure and inducement, are then prosecuted on terrorism charges and material support. The targets of these sting operations have often been young people who are mentally ill, financially insecure, or otherwise vulnerable. The FBI and its informants, often in a course of many months, work on people's hesitation by promising financial rewards, applying psychological pressure, and even purporting to supply them with fake religious guidance that appears to sanction the violence. So in just on one famous case in Chicago, the FBI actually created a fake Saudi sheikh who told this individual who was hesitant about uh, violence that this is completely approved by you know, my, my, my Saudi sheikh. Um, and so I just want to give you one very quick example of that, uh, which is uh, this past summer, a federal judge in one of these cases uh, granted actually a compassionate release motion uh, to three uh, black men in New Jersey who had been entrapped by an FBI informant uh, and then sentenced for 25 years in uh, prison in 2011. Um, these men had been subject to pressure and promises by informants to pay if they would consult, agree to, to commit uh, what they thought was an act of violence. And the judge in releasing them said this about the FBI's behavior. She said, nothing about the crimes of conviction was defendant's own doing. The FBI invented the conspiracy, identified the targets, federalized what would otherwise have been a state crime, and picked the date for the mission. The real lead conspirator was the United States. Uh, and despite the attempts to make the FBI more accountable after the revelations of surveillance against Dr. King, uh, the church committee, you know, all of the focus in Congress on reigning in the FBI, there's actually been precious little oversight or accountability over the past 20 years. In fact, it's been loosened uh, continuously throughout that time period. So courts defer to security agencies and refuse to second guess their decisions. Congress hasn't investigated this issue, these issues with nearly the degree of attention that they need. So the FBI essentially is self-governing, subject to very few actual constraints or checks or balances. Um, and I focus on the FBI because one of our themes here is 1963 and this moment of surveillance. Um, but it's important to note that the FBI's actions were part and parcel of a far wider 
and still continuing uh, US-led war on terror. And acts of horrific violence and the framing of a terrorist threat can often lead states to respond with levels of violence that rarely get the same attention or condemnation. And according to the Brown University Cost of War Project, now when you think about these 20 years of the global war on terror, over 940,000 people have died in these wars due to direct war violence, including 430,000 civilians. And they estimate that uh, some 3.6, 3.8 million people have died indirectly in post 9-11 war zones. So Dr. King was seen as dangerous in his own time, not just because he fought for civil rights and racial equality, but also because he spoke out against both unjust economic structures and also about foreign policy, namely the Vietnam War. Um, and some of the harshest criticism he got was when he spoke out on US foreign policy and dared to question the US security state. So our conversations, I think, about surveillance and repression of political movements uh, within the US uh, should also take into account the larger context of our policies uh, around the world. Dr. Uh, Martin, thank you. And the Institute is in good hands. <laughs> thank you. you. If this is any indication, thank you. Right, thank your leadership you. is much appreciated and welcomed. And thanks to everybody for showing up. Um, I started my project about 10 years ago at the 50th anniversary. I went to both commemorative marches at the March on Washington. And every single speaker said, yeah. Dr. King's dream said this, and then they, their agenda followed. And I thought, my goodness, they're remembering the dream before they remember the march, before they remember the revolution. And you should study them the other way around. What made Dr. King's vision and leadership possible is something I ask my students all the time. And there's a mass movement here. I'm currently working on a book called Summer of Discontent, Black Revolution and Civil Rights Reform, 1963. Um, and I'm grateful to you for talking about today, because I can talk about today, tomorrow. I want to do a deep dive into yesterday, uh, because I think there are things to learn. Uh, my book aims to marry local and national stories of both the celebrated and the unsung, uh, to probe many meanings of freedom now, another slogan. Um, and their connections to economic justice, uh, to pose all over why a wave of protests, almost universally named then to be revolutionary, is not remembered as such today, it has to do with that counter-revolution, uh, to demonstrate how media actors frame, showcase, and neglected dozens of local expressions of nonviolence and self-defense, and to explain the course of policy why manifold demands coming from over 1,400 protests in over 200 locales were channeled into a landmark civil rights bill whose cornerstone was desegregation of public accommodations. In this period, both the Supreme Court and Congress pushed to the limit the property rights of private businesses to exclude black customers and patrons, a real victory. But the Kennedy bill deflected and deferred as much as it achieved um, thanks to others at this conference who highlight issues of jobs, gender justice, militancy in northern and western cities, issues of employment, housing, segregated education, police brutality. Everywhere they were pushing accepted boundaries of nonviolent discipline, getting arrested, getting attacked, fighting back. Often, protesters battle police in Philadelphia, Brooklyn, Chicago, as well as the bombings in Birmingham. I'm especially interested, though, today in retelling a very neglected story. It's there in the literature. It's there in Clay Carson's book, In a Struggle, um, by my thesis advisor. Um, nearly forgotten story of Southern voting rights workers' demands for federal protection. Let John Lewis of SNCC, the March on Washington, make the case for Title III 
protections against police violations of activist civil liberties, among other things. We march today for jobs and freedom, but we have nothing to be proud of, but hundreds and thousands of our brothers are not here, for they are receiving starvation wages or no wages at all. While we stand here, there are sharecroppers in the Delta of Mississippi who are out in the field working for less than $3 a day, 12 hours a day. While we stand here, there are students in jail on trumped up charges. Our brother James Farmer, along with many others, is also in jail. We come here today with a great sense of misgiving. It is true that we support the administration's civil rights bill. We support it with great reservation, however. Unless, unless Tile 3 is put in this bill, there's nothing to protect the young children and old women who must face police dogs and fire hoses in the South while they engage in peaceful demonstrations. In its present form, this bill will not protect the citizen of Danville, Virginia, who must live in constant fear of a police state. It will not protect the hundreds and thousands of people who have been arrested upon Trump charges. What about the three young men, Nick Fear's secretary in America, Georgia, who faced the death penalty for engaging in peaceful protests? We must have legislation that will protect the Mississippi sharecropper who was put off in his form because he dared to register to vote. We need a bill that will provide for the homeless and starving people of this nation. We need a bill that will ensure the equality of a maid who earns $5 a week in a home of a family whose total income is $100,000 a year. We must have a good FEPC bill. My friends, let us not forget that we are involved in a serious social revolution. Where is the political party that would make it unnecessary to march in the streets of Birmingham? Where is the political party that will protect the citizens of Albany, Georgia? Do you know that in Albany, Georgia, nine of our leaders have been indicted, not by the Dixocrats, but by the federal government for a peaceful protest. But what did the federal government do when Albany Deputy Sheriff beat Attorney C.B. Kane and left him half dead? We are tired. We are tired of being beaten by policemen. We are tired of seeing our people locked up in jail over and over again. And then you holler, be patient. How long can we be patient? We want our freedom and we want it now. <laughs> We must get in this revolution and complete the revolution. On the Delta of Mississippi, in Southwest Georgia, in the Black Belt of Alabama, in Harlem, in Chicago, Detroit, Philadelphia, and all over this nation, the black masses are on the march for jobs and freedom. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Crucial backstory here. This is courtesy of the Library of Congress. Uh, about stuff from the American Archive. They had to make their own news. Um, SNCC and CORE had always fought for equal access to sources and media coverage. They were forced to creatively make their own news uh, because, uh, honestly, Dr. King and SCLC got the lion's share of attention then and perhaps today. Uh, Greenwood, Mississippi emerged as a locale where activists persisted and local people sustained a mass movement in the face of violence and intimidation. It's a crucial inflection point. The Justice Department, beginning of April 63, initiated and then they dropped legal action against Greenwood police for violating civil liberties and of the potential voters and registration workers. Uh, par partly in response to this ball of repression, Senators Keating and Javits from New York revived Title III a measure cut out of the compromised 1957 Civil Rights Act, which would have given the Attorney General authority to intervene on his own initiative where any rights were violated. Greenwood made news for a while, okay? 
shooting of Jimmy Travis, the mass meetings, but increasingly Birmingham and its demands for equal access and hiring of police commandeered press and government attention. Greenwood faded from the news and SNCC resorted to sending telegrams that mostly got covered in the black press. It's a quote from Julian Bond, but if you sent a telegram, that would be newsworthy. Mm -hmm. We're trying to make news too. Um, um, Birmingham and discussions with SCLC negotiators profoundly shaped Kennedy administration understandings of what Negroes want. Nine days after the Birmingham settlement, on uh, May 11th, Justice Department civil rights head Burt Marshall explained to John and Robert Kennedy, quote, this business of going in and out eating at lunch counters, it's the one thing that makes all Negroes, regardless of age, maddest. I don't know. <laughs> There's some actually, uh, Will, in your book, you cite some, some uh, uh, opinion polls, a great Newsweek poll that across the country, so we talk about. Um, but let me show you, they're, they're explicitly rejecting the authority, and let me tell you why. Okay. This is uh, an audio tape from the Miller Center from the Oval Office. Uh, I hope you can read it. Um, but in your pretty plan, Bert Marshall, Bobby Kennedy, John Kennedy, discussing what's going to be the, the cornerstone of the new bill. You asked a question. This little. Well, it would be helpful if we get that voting bill by. It would be helpful if we get the public accommodations bill by. And it would be helpful if we get the school bill by. And it would be very unhelpful if we get section <laughs> Title III by. Because if we think we have troubles now, if we get Title III by, I mean, we just. Among other things, that, that would be all the right Title III is the right of the Justice Department to initiate protection for all rights, all constitutional rights. protest, what Dr. King in 1945 said, the great glory of American democracy is the right to protest for right. If you undergird that, there'll be hell to pay. There'll be no end of disorder and potential violence. And they're especially concerned in reporting after reporting of Edison II. Not with the international image in the Cold War. That mattered. But is this thing going to spread to the North, right? And are we going to have mass violence? in the big cities. Um, so uh, here, <laughs> in conclusion, I want to take us to an even more obscure place in the historiography, Plaquemine, Louisiana, and West Feliciana Parish. This guy's name is Ronnie Moore. He worked for CORE with James Farmer, who was in jail at the time in Plaquemine. Uh, and they were marching for desegregation, as well as for incorporating of the black community into the town so they could benefit from the tax, tax base. Um, and the core volunteers and field secretaries like Ronnie are getting beaten, jailed, and burned with electric cattle prods. Okay. So this is what he has to say uh, about that situation. You asked the question, what Negroes want in voter registration. If you just take a good look at this Mississippi River and uh, then think and then count <laughs> and you come up with a large number of Negroes who've been found floating down this river from one century to another and you begin to wonder what we really want. Well, it's one word, protection. At one time, they lynched Negroes and they threw them in the Mississippi River. Now, they arrest them, beat them with clubs, and then find them guilty in the courtroom. 
time hasn't changed very much. It's just changed from one form into another. We need anti-lynching laws. We need laws that will guarantee criminal justice at the, in the courtrooms of the South. And we need laws that will guarantee fair law enforcement. In short, we need protection. Just the other day, a Negro minister was arrested. And uh, moments after he was arrested, his family picked up guns to protect their own homes because they definitely could not secure protection from the law officials. So um, we, we have depended upon God so long, and uh, we will continue to depend upon God. But the only uh, problem now is to whether or not we'll be able to wait on God. And this is the problem that uh, uh, we have in the Deep South. We've depended upon the federal government. How long can we wait on the federal government? And definitely suppression will not breathe love continuously. Suppression will not breathe love continuously. Where is this going? That power. Mm -hmm. It is the essential precondition for understanding the direction of Southern and You. Uh, I'm going to wrap this up. Probably out of time. Uh, this also happened in Selma, uh, two years before the famous Selma March. Uh, Bernard Rodea was there getting beaten, and um, let's see, uh, Selma Freedom Day, October. Uh, that's Howard Zinn, an ally. That's James Baldwin, an ally. There's a town that's ruled by terror by mob rule. And uh, Howard Zinn is making the case for. Uh, hey, we already have legal authority under the Enforcement Act of 1871 to intervene in these situations. Why are we exercising that? Tony Lewis of the New York Times was actually saying that as well, right? But the Kennedy voters would have nothing. Uh, and so this, you know, this is just uh, an example. And it was it was stunning to me to read this. They are trying to hand out water to people who have been waiting in line all day. What's the state that's outlawing giving people water in line today? Georgia. Oh, okay. Not Alabama. So they're off. <laughs> At any rate, there's very little coverage, very little coverage of Alabama Freedom Day. So what do they do? They send a telegram. And this is Jim Foreman saying, why can't the Justice Department take steps to, to have Sheriff James Clark placed under an immediate temporary restraining order, et cetera, et cetera. This is the chap who was uh, there in the more famous steps. Um, so it mostly made news in the black press too. Um, in fact, under pressure from the movement, yeah, there's uh, SNCC's own, under pressure for the movement, this will be concluding, uh, the House Judiciary Committee passed Title III in October. And Bobby Kennedy immediately went down to Manny Seller's committee and said, this is unacceptable. It's not going to pass Congress. This president does not support this. Right? Take it out. And they campaigned and pressure to remove it. Uh, and that's um, before 1994, the, the first time or the last time we saw uh, this kind of authority. Um, yeah. And so that's, that's I'll sort of wrap this up by saying um, Smithsonian folkways get a record. I mean, what's cool about this is they're finding channels of communication to get their story told, but they're not the dominant media, right? So they're recruiting independent filmmakers or KQED, which was Ronnie Moore's right documentary. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I'm not going to play this because I'm out of time, but uh, you should listen to this. Mm -hmm. It's very eye-opening about the Greenwood story. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> We have a, a little bit of time for Q&A um, conversation. I want to first allow, we have any students in the room? Do we have any students, undergrads, grad students? I'm not going to assume, I'm not going to look in any direction. But if we have any students, I'd like for them to have the floor first to get the first question or comment. And then, um, then I'll take a moderator's privilege. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Um, I, I would like to hear really quickly from all our panelists, at least, 
you can talk about one particular source. All of you mentioned amazing sources that you were pulling your foot And I would like if you could all just start us off by just saying a brief word about one particular source that you used, a particular source that you found that's been overlooked in helping us understand uh, the connections between 63 today. I love if we could just start in the literary law. Is it that would be, be great? Mm -hmm. From there, just raise your hand and we'll just have a conversation. Um, so, one source that I found incredibly helpful is Dr. King, uh, a column in the Amsterdam News, um, a regular column from 1962 to 1966. I'm saying, like, Part of what they were trying to do was to break through the ways that the media was defining issues or were defining the, like, what the movement was about. And so um, to me, getting to see the, the kind of regular issues that he's talking about, um, you know, and, and how he's framing them, um, often against the ways they're being framed in the, in the national news. And so kind of going back to like the way that Dr. I think we often talk about the Panthers, we talk about like the, you know, Malcolm in terms of making their own newspapers, but I think we really miss the way that Dr. King like uses like a like, and then he has a column in the Chicago Defender, right? And that's also interesting, right? So these kinds of the ways that Dr. King is trying to change the media narrative. And, and all those sources you mentioned, for those who don't know, are African American newspapers. Yeah, they're and they're and they're now all digitalized. Yeah. And so you can you can like pull all of the you know biweekly columns like and get to see all the different things. Yeah, I mean, since I was studying the misuses of civil rights memory, for me it was much more about what for me doesn't even feel like that long ago. So 1980 to 2020, although at this point 1980 is actually kind of a long time ago. Uh, if so. Since I was looking at different social movements that were co-opting King, the Wayback Machine was really helpful, and that's archive.org. Um, and this was a way that, at least for the early days of the internet, I could go back and look at organizational websites, read their press releases, see how they were strategizing, potentially using or misusing civil rights memory. So I'm not a historian, and so I haven't been digging in archives, so I will just say that uh, beyond finding the works of some of our panels and the people in the room <laughs> incredibly useful. I'm going to take the question a different way, which is I, I would not recommend your deep dives into some of the legal opinions. Um, because, uh, that may not be the best place to go. But if you want to understand some of what the FBI is engaged in today, there are actually some fantastic documentaries that explore particular cases. And I will just mention the Newberg Four, which is actually a, a fairly at least, I don't know, seven, eight, maybe even 10 years old, but it's about the particular case that I mentioned involving these four men from an impoverished community in New Jersey uh, and their story. And that's a recommendation for uh, something to help familiarize the present with relation to the past. So much that people haven't seen and can't see. You can't, you can't see this stuff from the Library of Congress yet. They're working very, very slowly. Um, what's the source? ProQuest, the great information octopus, uh, gobbling up all of these great sources, uh, has the entire John F. Kennedy Library Civil Rights Collection online. And there is an interview there with all of the leaders of the March on Washington immediately after the March on Washington, WTTG, DC. And there's one transcript in the Kennedy Library. Uh, John, you reference J.R. Kennedy, J. Richard Kennedy. He's an FBI plan. I thought you said CIA. I don't know, FBI or CIA. He's working for Pierre Salinger, the press secretary, right? And John Riley in the Department of Justice, who wants to make sure that the line of questioning goes the way the president wants. If you read this thing, it is total milk toast. He has, he, J. Richard Kennedy talks for half the program about what a great achievement it was to bring all these Negroes to Washington and didn't riot. Right? Wow. And that Dr. King gets so upset at one moment, he said, the more we talk about violence, the more we, we invite violence. Why aren't we talking about the goals of this march? And it's a transcript that blew my mind because I found out from Harry Belafonte's autobiography that J. Richard Kennedy 
right, uh, had been and still was. I don't know, was it CIA? Did you yeah, just? CIA. It's CIA then. The FBI tried, right? He FBI did, back in the 50s. He did, when he he, liked the FBI. <laughs> he's managing Be Belafonte, right? Uh, he married Stan Levison's ex wife. Uh, but, uh, yeah, his name's Richard Solomonick, um, <laughs> aka John. So it's just the interstices. You know, in the Kennedy Library, too, the, the John Riley papers has handwritten notes. Um, what are we going to do if, ta if communists take over the podium? How are we going to pull the plug on this, right? This march, uh, and so it just sort of underscored to me the pervasive fear that protest, right, uh, was going to result in violence. Another source, that, uh, there are 40,000 letters from Martin Luther King in Baroquist, Octopus, and it's incredible to read these things um, at the time, and scholars haven't, haven't not part of the literature. I was just going to add, I, I, I love that you played the audio from the White House, and, and there's a lot more of that that we have only begun to scratch the surface of, too. And, you know, the, phone the Miller board. Center Public Affairs. Yeah, the Miller Center. This LBJ stuff, yeah. too. There's just a ton of audio. Um, some of it's been transcribed, some of it hasn't, but we're, we're all still finding things yeah. that are really important. Yeah. yeah. Other questions, please go right ahead. It's a weird question that just occurred to me in a probably articulated badly, but spurred by something Tom just said. I mean, one of the reasons a lot of us, have, you know, all of us have an image of that particular speech. In her head, because it's recorded by the U.S. Information Agency, which I'm sure most people know, is actually then broadcasts it globally, because they're already spinning this narrative in a way that's suggesting um, that this is firmly in the American grain in the context of the Cold War. Only uh, a country, a proud democracy like the United States, would invite its demonstrators into its very bosom. So it becomes this sort of celebration. And there's a, and there's a weird way, of course, when, and this is, um, Professor, I've yeah, yeah, not yet read your book, but I now need to. Um, you know, and in fact, that's, you know, I recall what, what you're saying, of course, she and Seth before all the stuff you've been telling us for a very long time about the misappropriation of this, you know, it's a perverse way to, one way of telling the story is the way King tells it. We were passed a bad check four years ago. The other is what a proud democracy. But the question I want to ask, and anybody can take it, is that was also part of King's own strategy, was to write this movement into the American grain. And that speech, perhaps as much as any other that he did, is, it's, it's the perfect expression of the politics of the human people. Quoting the nation's, you know, founding charters back to it on this most sacred sites. I just would love to hear some of your reflections about that. I mean, uh, I don't know where that question would go, but he's, he's doing that himself. Yeah, it was strategic respectability, and I've spoken to people who's grandmothers were at the marsh and said they were really proud, the images on TV, right, of, of orderly, well-dressed black people were there. So there is that line, um, and uh, uh, I lost some train of thought there, but um, the uh, Tomika Brown Nagin's book on Atlanta is so eye-opening because she shows that the black middle class there and that traditional media or leadership class was not involved, and they did not endorse the sit-ins at Rich's department store. After the March on Washington, to them and to the Atlanta Daily World, which had, ne which had not supported the March on Washington until it came off the way it did, um, they get behind the idea of direct action at Rich's, and King joins them, and they actually desegregate it in, uh, by December, okay? So in a way that politics of respectability also uh, played for, you know, unity within certain black communities that it was a singular problem in 63. Do you get the established elders, right, 
involved in this radical action, uh, and how do you do so? And March on Washington gave up an era of respectability to them. I mean, I guess I would like to take the first part of your question, which is that I think crucial to the kind of Cold War civil rights narrative that the United States is like projecting around the country is the fact that it's a Southern regional problem, not a national problem, right? And so the ways that we don't know the Northern story, the ways that we have these ideas about black people in the North are alienated and angry, that King doesn't go there. These are all, you know, part of like, so if we look at how the media is covering, you know, Little Rock or Birmingham, it's very different. Like it's at the very same time as they're covering New York, Chicago, and certainly like what's getting projected. Um, I guess one of the things I've been so interested in is actually how much King is retelling the story of the United States post the Civil War to talk about white privilege, like with the FHA. Like, I, I mean, I feel like, so I'm writing a book on King in the North. That wasn't obvious. <laughs> um, and I've just been so surprised by, like, again, I always think that talking about the FHA and the GI Bill is like our generation of scholars, right? And there he is, talking about the FHA, talking about the GI Bill, talking about how, you know, this like retelling the history of the 20th century, right? As a kind of history where, you know, white people get, a, you know, like, so it's not just going back to slavery in terms of like the bad check, um, but this, this history of, you know, land grants, FHA, um, highway construction, all of this stuff that, again, like, so he's telling a different history of the 20th century, I think. So I think there's ways that he's, he's playing into the United States, an idea of the United States, but I think there's also ways that he's really trying to get the United States to face a different sort of history. I hate to ask these what if questions, but I feel like you guys all address this issue of, um, and Haj, you talked about history's being obstructed almost immediately. And as soon as King finishes his I have a dream speech, what does JFK say as he's shaking his hand? I have a dream, right? That's the part of the speech that he's going to go with. So I wonder if you guys reflect a little <laughs> bit on what might have happened if King hadn't improvised, if he just stuck to the script of his speech and ended it with the economic issues and not talked about his dream. What impact might that have had on him at that moment? I mean, that's the counterfactual, right? right? Yeah, to think that it was the dream. When we think about the misuses, so much of it is constructed around the so-called dream of colorblindness. We have like an entire swath of sociological theory around colorblind theory and the way that it's just repackaging racism and, you know, sort of this common and friendly way where we say that we believe in colorblindness and therefore we don't have to talk about racism. And so when you do, then you must be the anti-white racist. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, for me, it's, it's hard to even imagine what would happen. I, mean, I imagine it still would have been a charismatic speech. I don't think it would have been the defining speech of his, his legacy and his co-optation, but I would love to hear from the actual historians, right? <laughs> and would John Lewis's have speech gotten more attention? Right. Mm -hmm. He would have found another way to bring the house down. I mean, that was, <laughs> um, but um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think that uh, he left out a phrase that was runs throughout his sermon or his speech on, on the dream. He said, "I have a dream that my children will not be judged by the content of the of the color of skin, but the content of their character." Sort of his favorite. But the the phrase after that is, "I have a dream to live in a nation where um, the." Uh, uh, we do not take necessities from the masses to give luxuries to the classes. He actually says that to the uh, RWDSU union in September 25th up in New York City. At the Detroit March, he says that. And at the Detroit March. Yeah. Yeah. And he says that left out of yeah. Washington, maybe in the interest of this respectability thing, or not looking radical to the Kennedy administration. But, um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the economics are there. You, you're absolutely Right, they're more of a metaphorical. John Lewis is talking about actual poor people and not a poor equality of a maid. There, that uh, John Lewis in in, in 20, uh, 2013 didn't mention any of this. The PBS program, the March where Clay Carson is on it, it didn't mention 
the equality of an aid. It didn't mention you know, the unemployed and, and low wages and no wages at all. It's just like missing. And it's missing from the progressives on commemoration of that. The only person who mentioned it was Arlene Baker from the AFL-CIO. She said, John Lewis stood up for the rights of maids who were earning $5 a week, right? And this in 12 hours of, you know, you can watch it all on C-SPAN. I wanted to, to ask, um, curious what you all, but I want to start with you. You start with the 1980s in the book, and obviously we know that's the age of Reagan. That's Reagan and making America great again. That's playing in America. I'm wondering if you could say, almost think about the Reagan moment and reusing King for Reagan's vision of America. And do you see any commonalities with our current moment? How King is being used. Is there a connection? Is there a shift? I would love to hear you think about that. Anyone else wants to jump in? Yeah, yeah, there's absolutely a connection. And for me, it's a through line. Um, yeah, the way I describe it in the book is you know, the, the memory of King and of civil rights is sort of rooted in the trunk of the tree and these ideological debates that go into the making of the King holiday. And Jeannie have written about this as well, many others have. Um, it's, I call it like the fractures. Right at the base of the tree, because from the get-go, we are institutionalizing really competing visions of Dr. King. One is the one that's like really rooted in the black grassroots memory. It's the one that's the true king, the radical king, the one that hasn't been defanged. And then the one that becomes more prominent is the one that Reagan institutionalizes, where he very strategically says, we're going to remember a selective version of Dr. King. And he strips him of all of that radical context he uses him as a kind of ending, the last chapter of racism. He uses him as a symbol of the free market, of American exceptionalism. And so that is the project through the Reagan presidency, is invoking King in these moments when he is repealing civil rights. He's trying to roll them back. And it's not that long after their gains, right? And he does it in a way that makes it feel like it's truly American, it's patriotic, and it's just the beginning, right? So that is where... You know, in my view, the, the co-optations really begin and now they're speed, they snowball. And one of the pictures in the book is this figure where we have these gnarled branches of memory because of the multiple competing ways that he gets used in the service of all these different political projects. And so that's why when we look out today and we're like, how come nobody remembers the king that we, at least in this room, know? It's because it was an intentional political strategy because he had so much power in his radicalism, in the unfinished dream and the work that, you know, Coretta Scott King was picking up and continuing so many other activists. So to defang him is really to make sure that he's remembered in a, a kind of voided way where he's just a symbol. I've described him as a kind of moral cloak that people can put on and it gives their cause moral legitimacy, even when it's completely anti-Kingian. So that's my take, but I'm like, please, <laughs> I mean, he's getting defanged while he's alive. Um, so that, like, I think one of the things that's so hard to be king in, like, 63 and 64 is, like, he's saying so the way he's being, again, like, the, the media narratives that are um, being constructed about, you know, so that they're all sorts of coverage and he's getting much more sympathetic coverage um, when he's in the south but then when you start to look at what like when he's you know in LA or when he's in New York or when he's you know there's kind of two different kinds of things that are happening in these years one is they're just completely ignoring it right so how the New York Times describes King going back and forth for that whole 1964 year trying to like you know like um, Stop the passage of Prop 14 is they call it a speaking tour. He's calling it the, one of the most shameful tragedies of the 20th century in a vote for ghettos, and they never cover it. The LA Times is supporting Prop 14. So they quote King, but they don't quote why he's talking about why he's so against it. They don't talk about, like, so I think one of the things that I've really started to realize, again, coming out of, like, often, like, kind of, you know, my argument are more beautiful and terrible about the kind of more modern misuses. 
but there is a real way that he's getting defanged and not, not listened to. And then he's constantly trying to be like, that's not what I said, right? Or journalists talk about us being pompous when he's making a moral critique of the North. He's pompous, he's arrogant, the kinds of words they're using. Um, so I think there's the kind of schizophrenic, like, like how, like, what's happening literally while he's still with us. I just might add briefly, um, it was uncanny when I heard Ronald Reagan say, um, Dr. King seized America's heart because America had a great heart to be seized. Uh, and if y'all you, you can watch Civil Rights Roundtable, it's a USIA 1963 production with celebrities who showed up in the March on Washington that day. And Charlton Heston said, well, what impresses me is that we arrived at the point where Dr. King's check is finally cashable. And what does Harry Belafonte do? He goes ballistic. <laughs> and he says, we are not finished. The struggle is beginning. We have profiteers to take care of, and we have a, a national movement. And it's kind of inspiring to hear, you know, Belafonte is not going to let that ideological shrinkage <laughs> well, I mean, go. <laughs> one of my favorite moments, as Jonathan knows, is Belafonte confronts a New York Times reporter at King's funeral. Like, you are responsible. Um, yeah. And so this, like, he's, like, so angry that they've gathered around to, like, you know, rend the garments and, like, be all sad. And he's like, no. I think one thing that I, remember just, I don't remember Rich Reporter. You know, figure it out, but I don't remember. Because, you know, it was probably Gene Roberts. I know, and Gene Roberts is like, Gene oh, he's won a Pulitzer Prize for writing a I, book about right. how the journalists for the heroes, the exactly. I know, I know. Exactly. So, Royce right. B, that book? Yeah, Royce right. B, right. 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 excuse me. Yeah, that, that's the guy who covers Black Power for the time. Right, and he's horrible. Kind of the, <laughs> the missing of the narrative, right, and the, and the construction of a narrative of the good civil rights movement which people like we supported, which was about liberalism and all of these sorts of things, has now been hijacked by angry young black militants. That, that, the first draft of history is the American press, and now I guess the second draft too. So I'd be really interested to know that is Gene Roberts. Gene Roberts is terrible about King in the North too, besides the black power. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, I was just gonna say what I find interesting in hearing this conversation is that I think the question was framed in terms of Reagan and kind of the right, but just as the conversation has gone, it's you know, it's also mainstream media, it's liberal media, it's northern media, it's all of that. And just thinking about the present um, and the kind of continued distortion of King's legacy, it's also it's not just the conservatives who cite King to destroy affirmative action, right? It's also um, elite liberal institutions, including universities, that uh, you know, think about, in, for example, law school context, which present dissent and legal activism as being OK in certain forms. It's wonderful in the context of you know, polite legal appellate argument, but um, not in the form of sort of messy street politics and disruptive social movements. Um, and so. I guess maybe my question back to, to the historian, many historians and others, scholars of King in the room is that how much of this was the right reframing King to, in the service of particular political ideologies and how much of it was just mainstream kind of liberal America and its prominent institutions? Until Black Lives Matter, the way that Obama talked about race was through the civil rights movement. I mean, if we go back and look at the big speeches he gives on race, it's all about the civil rights movement until Black Lives Matter forces him, forces his hand. So I think, I mean, to, like, I think there's a convenience in talking about the right and there's a, a kind of a horror. But in some ways, I think the more dangerous has been like the liberals and the ways they're weaponizing it against. I mean, the Stop Cop City stuff. Yeah, I, mean, that was, I totally agree with you. That was definitely for me one of the more concerning findings in the book was, you know, I'm seeing it like in the Clinton era that yes, I mean, power maintains itself and power includes the liberal establishment. So yes, I totally agree. With you. So, no, um, this is a great conversation. I, I want to raise 
thought in response to what we were just talking about, especially for uh, Professor uh, Yazdiha. Um, the fact that King was corrupted and defanged, as we've talked about, I see it as a mixed blessing. On one hand, it's, it's something horrible and tragic. On the other hand, I think strategically, there's huge advantages for us because if he's defanged, we could keep his fangs in our pocket, his ferocity, his revolutionary ideas. And, you know, the choice is, you know, mainstream Americans, right or left, they don't know who James Farmer is. They don't know who James Foreman is. They don't know who Reverend Shuttlesworth was. They don't know who C.T. Vivian was. Everyone knows who Dr. King is because he's been embraced when he wasn't in his life. But that embrace, embracing, even with these distortions, it, it gives power to telling the truth about Dr. Because nobody can say, I, I hate Dr. King. Yeah, so I think strategically there's advantages for us. That's really compelling. I feel like we should talk about that, as a group, right? That's an interesting idea. I think for me, the danger is that the way that he's been defanged has been used in the service of rolling back civil rights. Mm -hmm. So I think it's the part where he's been weaponized and putting the things back in or keeping them in our pocket feels less valuable. And part of it might just be that maybe he's just not our symbol anymore. But I also think I mean, Jean, in her new book, I, you should talk about it more, Jean, because I think you're making a good case for, you know, refanging King, if you will, and um, for a new era and <coughs> bringing him back into public consciousness in a way that I think will connect with Gen Z and a younger generation who's very politically active, but has kind of thrown the baby out with the bathwater because he's yes. so diffused and watered down. Jean and I were just talking about this two hours ago, sitting outside about how the fact that, and this goes to your point, every school in America has a King curriculum. It's there already. How do we alter it? How do we get people to start teaching them? It wouldn't be that hard to say, okay, you've taught, I have a dream. Now, the next semester, you have to teach the first half of the speech. There's gotta be a way to, to influence those curricula because the, it's out there, it's in the schools already, to your point. Maybe that's an advantage for us. How do we use that? Well, Rosa Parks is a good example. Yes. Yes. Right. She's a Trojan horse. Like a lot of my friends call her a Trojan horse, right? Because now, I mean, she's there, and so now we can bring exactly. her in um, all these things. But, right, so I think that's, I think there are ways that both of them are there, right? And so it's easier than, right, saying, okay, you got to introduce Laurie Richardson, right? You got to, you know, um, but I think it's still, like, it's like pushing a tidal, I mean, I feel like, again, talking about parks, right? Like, it's a tidal wave of like misinformation and like, you know, and, and how convenient it is on so many different sides, right? And like how much they get rolled out, you know, by liberals, by, you know, you know, people. A great Kennedy speech where he endorses the civil rights movement. He also says parades and protests threaten certain chaos and threaten lives. The presumptive illegitimacy of protest. I think this is a way we can push back. Uh, Bobby Kennedy in one of those audio uh, tapes says, well, you know, Dr. King's on violence. That's good because they go and they kneel down and they say their prayers. But these SNCC people, they're violent, right? Even though they're like trying to be violent. What he didn't appreciate is Dr. King was practicing massive disruption, mm -hmm. business as usual. And that's what he, can, that, you know, that's what SCLC achieved in, in, in Birmingham. That was what is inspiring to the um, welfare rights movement. Fran Piven told me that's the model, Birmingham. But that was what King, King had in mind for Washington, D.C. at the end disruptive civil disobedience and that was just presumptively violent in the view of of the media and of the Kennedy administration that's right they call it the apostle of nonviolent violence Please. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I think that in a way it's um, this sort of faux glorification of people is incredibly dangerous because I I really doubt that um, 
you know, there's all this talk about liberalism today, but I, I think that even at an institution like Stanford today, I don't see loyal dissent being something that's at all easy or um, encouraged. It seems um, really it's, it's kind of, uh, it's not encouraged. Um, all of this, yeah, it's, it's like taming these figures seems to suggest that, you know, actual um, significant changes can be made by easy movements when they're not. You know, none about, nothing about the civil rights movement was easy. It's still in process and difficult changes still have to be made. And that's not necessarily like we can't just kind of bank upon the idea that it can only be peaceful, it can only be lawful, because that's not the point about democracy and real change. Um, so to me, in response to that, I think it can conversely be really dangerous and that today we have a real severe problem about, um, you know, students have to blindly follow what is correct and just okay and within the, the lines of, of what an institution allows their students to do um, when it's not necessarily what history should, should have taught us. Especially around questions of disruption. I mean, thinking about the law school, I think you're exactly right. You have uh, about five moments, please. Do you want to... Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's also just important to keep in mind that Kennedy and Reagan and, you know, Clinton were not, like, looking around for somebody to sort of hold up as the model. So we're, they were forced to confront these king, right? I mean, so, I mean, Kennedy would have, I mean, he tried everything he could do to keep the the march from happening, you know, and, and when he failed, then he had to say, well, let's look for something that we can sort of latch on to. Reagan certainly did not want that to make a king holiday, right? So I think it's, it's important, you know, it was, it's co-optation, but it's also co-optation under duress, right? They, they, this is a, this is a evidence of the power of the, the movement. Yeah, I mean, political duress, which, you know, we can talk about what the stakes really are if you're the dominant force in power and, you know, the duress is more like, can I woo these white moderates? Like, yeah. Those were the stakes for Reagan. So you're right. I mean, it's not like, you know, he didn't have a choice in quotes, but I think we have to recognize the brilliance of that strategy because it did set off all of this kind of trajectory in motion that let him achieve these goals while tying his legacy to Dr. King's. I don't know. I mean, I think part of it too is like thinking about, there was like a quote from Coretta Scott King and it was on the evening of the election, the Reagan election, and she said, I'm afraid if Reagan's elected, we're gonna see a resurgence of the KKK and the White Citizens Council. And it's chilling to think that she already had that foresight. She knew exactly what it meant. And I just want to say, and, I, and David, please jump in. And the King Papers Project kicks off right as America's getting ready to start celebrating the first federal King holiday. And I just wonder, I don't know this for a fact, maybe Brother David does, I just wonder, is Coretta thinking, I have to have the nation read my husband's papers because they have to hear from him and not through all the interpreters now that he's going, it's going to be a federal holiday. I've often wondered that. Do you want to say anything? Yeah, I mean, I feel like the better person to answer that would be Dr. Carson, <laughs> obviously, in that sense. But I mean, I do think that. Well, I mean, just from Coretta's perspective. Yeah. Not Dr. Carson, yeah. but from Coretta's yeah. perspective. Yeah. I, and that's hard to say as well. Uh, but I do think, right, like, again, yeah, like, there is sort of an irony that it is like King Papers Project, because I'm always like, as soon as a new student comes in, they go start with their first task. It's just like, you're going to meet so many people that are in many ways, like, probably more important to King in some ways. And I think sometimes it's interesting that we have King space here, because I think a lot of people that I mentioned have been like John Lewis or these other figures who deserve in many ways their own spotlight. And the right, irony is that King. But then I think the way they think about that more is that, I mean, you know, this used to be a debate more like 20 years ago, right? Where it's like, when will the next Dr. King show up and magically push America further ahead? And I remember that being sort of a thought when I was growing up. Um, I do think that there is something relatively unique about King. And there is that question of 
if King never existed at all, you would still have a civil rights movement. You'd still have amazing things that go on during the 60s because it's just the time frame was set for it. But I think King is able to symbolize and capsulize a lot of it. And I mean, a lot of the general literature is that, like, he just has a way with words. He has a charisma that helps set that. And I think that goes back <laughs> to that point then where it is. Sometimes it is, right, like the smallest thing of like how to get people in. It's just getting out of the way and letting King speak to the current audience. Because, I mean, I, when we talk about a lot of these issues, right, like King is being co opted in his own day. So the fact that he's being co opted today, like King actually has things to say about that. And I don't know, even just from my own personal experience, like I had no idea who King was. <laughs> I mean, I did, but like, about like how. The fact this would like change my career and get me into history. I thought I was going to be a you know, math major <laughs> and everything like that. Um, but then it's just like I'm like, oh, you know, come to the King papers and I'm reading these sermons of King, and I'm just like, oh, wow, like he says that. I've never thought about faith like that before. And it's just, I think, in many ways, like I don't think anyone else interpreting that would have had the same effect. Any last comments or thoughts from our panels before we wrap right. up? I was in the room when Loretta visited Meyer Library in oh, LA, and she said, you know, my husband's legacy is, is really important to preserve. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think it's important to realize that there was a lot of testimony for the King holiday throughout the 1970s, and she's the only one, I have read all the testimony, she's the only one who said America has the opportunity to honor a labor leader. Mm -hmm. She's not the only one. I wrote about that. Oh, okay, <laughs> cool. I'll hear about that tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. One TV one day. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. Had a I was just going to say, I think it would be interesting to think, too, about, so beyond King, is this a tendency in our societies, kind of across the board internationally, to defang our leaders once they've actually partly at least succeeded in their missions? You think about... Uh, Gandhi mm -hmm. and the fact that he's been completely de-radicalized in terms of how people see him and his philosophy and what he stood for, the social economic change that he wanted to see. It was just about getting the British out of India. Like that's how, on, you know, in the West, he was uh, seen afterwards and within India, his kind of radical messages about equality, both for underclass, you know, subordinated castes and for uh, religious equality have been completely put aside in, in the national memory. Or Mandela, right? I mean, now we think of him as a hero for a long time. He was on the U.S. terrorist watch list because he uh, was considered, you know, a, the ANC was considered a terrorist organization by the U.S. government. Um, so anyway, I think this tendency to defame people once they've actually accomplished at least part of their mission and remember the, the most sort of uh, moderate version, and I don't mean moderate in terms of violence or not violence, but moderate in terms of like the structures that we think that they uh, were challenging as opposed to the structures we think that they uh, were not, or forget that they were actually challenging. I just, I completely agree with that. I just want to tell you a little bit of the story. Um, my name is Jonathan Green. Um, I participated in a um, conference in Johannesburg months ago, I didn't go there, I did it by, by Zoom, but it was to honor King, Mandela, and Gandhi. Mm -hmm. And I spoke exactly, you know, my strategy always is to bring the fangs in. <laughs> That's my strategy. So I said, because I also knew that the government of India had sent a delegation paid for by the government mm -hmm. to completely whitewash Gandhi as a supporter of the Modi government. I knew that. I knew that. So I said that if Gandhi were alive today, he would be in a hunger strike against the Modi government. And it's the first time I've ever gotten hate mail. Yeah. Um, I, I couldn't, you know, it's, I'm not surprised, but it's like, wow, I don't know how they got my email. Uh, because people don't like it. But it's a, it's a political strategy to hijack these leaders and use them in false ways to prop up power. I want to thank everyone for coming out this afternoon. We will reconvene uh, tomorrow at 9.30 for the, for the panel discussion.
930 for the panel discussion. We're going to focus tomorrow morning on the March on Washington in particular. Tanisha um, um, will be here to uh, talk a little bit about the King volume that will be coming out on 1963. Um, and then we'll have our panel discussion. All right. So thank you, everyone, for coming out. Thank you for a wonderful discussion. And thank you for See you back here tomorrow morning, and then tomorrow we have one more session to close this out. So thank you.